Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the convener of the Social Capital Research Group. Uh, our group promotes the advancement of social capital theories and we support anyone who wants to use the concept in research and practical applications. Uh, we have members from about 130 different countries. We have an active discussion group with over a thousand members and we hold regular webinars from invited speakers and, and PhD students. In this session, we welcome Professor Tyg Payne for a presentation and discussion about social capital and family entrepreneurship. Tyg Payne is the H. Norman Surridge Jr. and Community Coffee Company, Inc. Chair of Entrepreneurship in the Stevenson Department of Entrepreneurship and Family Systems at Louisiana State University. Professor Payne has published work at the intersection of entrepreneurship and strategic management for more than, more than 80 times, including publications in top journals. I'm sure anyone familiar with social capital literature has read his excellent co-authored article, Multi-Level Challenges and Opportunities in Social Capital Research, that was published in the Journal of Management in 2011. It is an excellent discussion of how social capital has been empirically applied across different levels of analysis, and I strongly recommend it if you haven't already read it. Dr. Payne recently completed a three-year term as the editor-in-chief of the Family Business Review, which is the leading journal dedicated to the study of family business. Uh, welcome, Ty, and over to you. Thank you, Tristan. Thank you for having me, and um, hello to everyone out there. I'm glad to see uh, so many people showing up, no matter what time of day it is. Um, for me, I have the privilege of having a, a 2 p.m. Um, date time, so I'm, I'm uh, pretty happy with having a nice sunny afternoon outside. Um, feel free uh, anywhere along the way if you want to, uh, you know, stop me, uh, have a question, you have a comment. Um, we'd like this to be much more of a discussion as opposed to just a monologue. Um, I did prepare some slides just to kind of get the conversation moving, um, but uh, that's kind of uh, I'd, I'd much rather us be engaged in uh, discussing new ideas than, than just you hearing from me. Makes it a lot less uh, difficult for me to, to, to go through this. So I just wanted to start with kind of giving a little of my background. Hopefully that would give you some ideas about where I'm coming from as far as my interests. And uh, then also how that those interests uh, meet with my, my research and, and my uh, teaching as well. Um, so my background, I was, I was raised in, in a small town of West, in West Texas, which uh, West Texas is an arid, dry land, um, a desert, a high desert. And um, I've lived in that area for most of my life. I recently moved to Louisiana just to uh, get a new, um, new perspective, change of scenery, basically, a good opportunity to work with some good uh, entrepreneurship scholars. And so I've moved from kind of my small town, um, West Texas roots to a bigger metropolis. I'm about an hour away from New Orleans, which most people know about. And, um, it's kind of been a, a, a refreshing change. Um, I, uh, my undergraduate degree was actually in pharmacy. So I come from a hard science background, but that was, basically because I was raised, my dad was a pharmacist and I was raised in, a, in this family business of pharmacy. And so my, uh, uh, my interest in family business kind of emerged from there, but it didn't really take, take hold until much later uh, after I was out um, past my PhD. My, I got an MBA and then a PhD, both from Texas Tech University. So why social capital? Um, I was thinking about that. I haven't really thought about this too much, but I would I would say that my initial interest started um, from my advisor. His name was John Blair, and he did a lot of uh, he was out of Michigan and did a lot of work in uh, with stakeholder theory. Um, and so when I was uh, working with him, uh, a lot of things were based on stakeholder. And he used to make these crazy big stakeholder maps. <coughs> which now I understand were much more uh, like, uh, like networks, right? He was, he was really a network theorist. He just didn't really know that's what it was at the time. And he called it stakeholder theory. And that's since evolved and um, 
but that was some of my early interests. I'd also, my interests were in configurations theory, agency theory, contingency theory. And then I developed this interest in social capital. All of these theoretical perspectives, I kind of, I, I, I enjoy because they, I guess, speak to me. Everybody has their kind of favorite theoretical perspectives because they make some kind of sense, right? So they, they, they speak to you in some way that other theories don't, or they explain things that you're interested in where other perspectives don't. And so um, social capital was one of those. And I was telling Tristan this a little bit before we started all this, that the, the paper that he referenced, this 2011 uh, Journal of Management Review paper, was one of my first forays into that, uh, into social capital, but it was actually it actually emerged in these two papers that were much later. Uh, my my uh, friend and, and writing partner, uh, Kurt Moore here, he, uh, he kind of got me interested in these things. We started up these two projects. Interestingly enough, these two projects started about in 2010. Well, maybe 2009 before we actually did this paper. And it was our discussions about these two papers, these two projects that stimulated us to say, well, we need to first dig into social capital from a multi-level perspective. And that stimulated this paper, this review paper um, from the outset. So um, unfortunately for many of you PhD students out there, the, <laughs> the reality is sometimes projects take 10 years to actually see the light of day. Um, and so you can have some that maybe it started much late and much earlier, but don't get published until much later, depending on how things go. Um, so the, the, the interest came phenomenologically here, uh, but then the review came here and we've been, we worked on these uh, for multiple years off and on until we finally got them to a, a position where, um, we could get them published in, in, good, in good journals. Um, so this particular one was working with uh, network organizations um, and looking at project-based uh, activities. Both of these used a, a data set that was based out of the um, Texas Department of Transportation. And we were looking at road construction um, companies and how they used uh, contractors, subcontractors in the bidding process that they went through, um, which made it a very interesting context, but um, it was actually a slow kind of couple of projects. So those, those areas where I was looking at networks and um, social capital and uh, building on, on, on our ideas, I really became fascinated with the, the multi-level aspect of social capital. And you'll see that kind of entering into um, what we're gonna kind of talk about today, which is uh, family business. Um, I started developing some interest in family business um, as a area of research because um, I came from that, but I also saw that it, it was really something that there were a lot of people out there that were in family businesses, but we didn't have a lot of research that really um, developed some of the problems or issues that family businesses were going through, despite family business being the biggest, uh, you know, organizational form in the world. I mean, there's, a, there's, there's estimations that, you know, we can have as many as 80% of all business organizations are family owned and operated. So it's, it's a prevalent organizational form, but we really didn't have that much dedicated to that. And we, we slowly continue to make some progress in that area, but family business has, to me, been really an uh, interesting context to which to think about social capital. So I'm gonna talk a lot about what, what we, I, I put forth in this recent book chapter with uh, one of my doctoral students, Nathan Hayes, and just hopefully with, through our discussions, we can talk about social capital and entrepreneurship and family businesses and this intersection that they have. And uh, maybe that will stimulate some discussions about 
new research projects, maybe practical applications, um, consulting uh, issues, whatever you're interested in talking about. So for, um, for just a kind of introduction, the family um, and the business are, are linked, right? They're, they're historically linked. The family is arguably, and I would think this is, I, don't, I can't see how somebody could disprove this, but the oldest social unit, right? The, the, the family started first. So as you have a family, it's the oldest social unit. And that's basically uh, makes them an important part of all of our lives. Um, and there's also this innate uh, connection that we have uh, that we're, we're tied to people either biologically or genealogically or socially over, over time that makes us family. And that's a, that's a strong uh, network of people that is very important in, mo in most of our lives, right? Um, but the other part of that is because families are, are so important, they become closely tied to businesses in most situations. So a couple of uh, facts in the U.S. anyway. Um, the family business accounts for about 83 million jobs, 7.7 .7 trillion of the GDP, and 87% of all tax-paying businesses. And this was an estimate. And the other part of that is the U.S. is probably on the lower side uh, compared to most most countries. So if we if it makes up this big of a uh, component of the U.S then there's many other countries out there which with much higher influence of family businesses. So the point being that the family and the business are linked together. And from that multi-level perspective, the family is a unit, a social unit, and the business is a social unit. And those two get slapped together. They're embedded. And um, that makes for a very unique and complex uh, social issue that uh, that I find very very fascinating. So the uh, the family business research has looked at at this issue of social capital in family business before. Some people have called this concept familyness. So it, looking at the firm level, they call it familyness, meaning it's it's the degree to which. Uh, resources and capabilities are bundled together in, as a result of the systems that, that as, as a result of these systems that interact, so family and business, right? So there's this kind of perspective that the, the degree of familyness is a firm level perspective, but it's built on this resources and capabilities that come from the family and business interaction. Um, Chris Munn, 2003, Chu and Litz described the construct as resources and capabilities related to family involvement and interactions. So family business or familyness started with kind of an RBV kind of perspective. Um, so a resource-based kind of view led it to be these results of these, these bundles of resources and capabilities. Uh, Pearson, Carr, and Shaw in 2008 brought this forward and used a social capital lens. And they, they talked about this more as, uh, as less of distinct entities between family and business and more about how they're enmeshed in complex web of relationships. So the, the resulting um, resources and capabilities that come from familyness or are described as familyness are a result from the synergies that are contained within the two systems. So that was one perspective. Another perspective was what was called family social capital. And this was, uh, I don't think it's not, Aragel, Hit, Sermon, Very. Um, they looked at this less as a synergistic kind of thing at the firm level and more of two different types or social groups that have a separate social capital or separate networks, separate social capital, but they intersect. So um, they discussed the family as just one of many types of social groups that coexist in, a, in an organization and that 
the, this group influences the organization's social capital. So they're different levels, different levels of analysis, but they're integrated. And they talked about the antecedents that lead to social capital being stability, interaction, interdependence, and closure. So in this case, they look at social capital from a family and an organizational perspective and how those are interlinked with one another. So in, in this little book chapter, we, we spelled out this, uh, this figure. And this was based off of uh, a, another uh, paper that uh, I co-authored with uh, several people. Um, but it basically put out a schema that kind of helped me personally identify areas for research or, you know, areas that create problems. So if you, if you look in here at the top is, is this is a multi-level kind of perspective. We've got individual issues, family-based issues, and business-based issues. So the family has its own, or the individual has its own relationships and network. It has, the individual has his or her own social capital and his or her own entrepreneurial outcomes. Those are embedded within the family that has those same, th same three things and the business that have those same three uh, aspects to it, which makes for a complex web of relationships. These are just connection, connections that can go up and down levels of analysis and make the whole, uh, whole ordeal of dealing with family business a very complex one. So flows from one to the other can be two way. I kind of draw, uh, have drawn this from a you know, left to right kind of uh, causal kind of perspective, but the reality is you can have uh, two way flows almost in all of these situations. Uh, you could have an individual that influences the family social capital but you could probably have family social capital that influences the individual network, there's feedbacks and such. But in general, we think from a temporal perspective, you go in from establishing a network of relationships that leads to the attainment or potential attainment of some kind of capital, and then that leads to certain outcomes. Um, so the flows are, are, are potentially uh, uh, both ways. And not all of these flows necessarily are positive flows. You know, we think about them in terms, or I think about them in terms largely of inf information, knowledge. Um, those types of things are easier, but that can be good information or bad information, for instance, um, that flows uh, from one, one aspect to another. Also, the types and strengths of these relationships are different. Every family, uh, every family business, every organization, every individual has, these are different. So understanding the nature of these is, is very complex. And then the issues of mechanisms. How do we take mechanisms that turn these networks into social capital and then into actions that kind of end up in here between this, this box and this box, actions that result in outcomes. And those are uh, like, the interesting intersections that I, I see in the family business, which make it just really fascinating to think about and study, <clears throat> excuse me, and also useful uh, in terms of, of consulting as well. So can we okay, just come in so, here, just a couple yeah, of questions if we, if we can pause yeah, just sure. for a moment. Um, I, I had a question. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit to what um, you see the social capital in that middle middle box there, what the social capital is, you know, because I think you've talked about the way in which uh, networks and relationships are basically, you know, it's kind of a source of social capital, um, the way in which actions are, are an outcome or a step towards the outcomes of social capital. So if you could talk a little bit about what you think social capital is in that middle section. Okay. Yeah. So my perspective has always been, or I've always felt like that there's, there's kind of a, a disconnect between what people talk about in terms of what is a network or a relationship versus what is social capital. We get those things confused quite often. And it's always helped me to think about the, the network as 
the pattern or structure of structures of relationships. So we have relationships. And then the social capital is those resources or capabilities that we gain from the nature of that network. So I look at social capital as actually capital, like real things that you get, uh, for instance, information. So the network is the source of the, of the information. The, the social capital is the actual information that I receive from my network. Uh, or the potential to be able to get that. So I always looked at social capital um, as something more tangible, I guess, um, whereas the network is more about the structure uh, or the nature of the ties or relationships that we have. A lot of times, especially more people that are, say, they're network theorists will kind of skip over this. They'll go from network to outcome and skip what is it in the middle that we're getting. And I might even skip over things in this particular drawing about what is between the actual, say, information or knowledge that I have, maybe it's human capital, maybe it's knowledge, whatever. How does that get put into an action here that actually leads to outcomes? Um, so these steps that we get uh, kind of get confusing and lost. Um, in, in, in particularly in our empirical or more quantitative type of studies. Did that answer your question at all? Yeah, I think it, I think it did. So the social capital, so information is one example of that kind of resource or benefit, you know, fairly tangible form of capital. Is there, is there a list of, of other forms of, of benefit that are social capital other than information? I, I'm, I think I've probably at somewhere along the way uh, given more examples, but one of them would be uh, simply uh, 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 financial capital, right? Um, that you could gain from the nature of your network. Um, financial capital, information, knowledge, uh, reputation, um, yeah, status, which was something we've looked at before. Uh, things like that, that some of them could be tangible, some of them could be intangible, but they are the result of the, or gained through the network of relationships. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess like we don't really need a list as long as we know what we're talking about, which is that those, those, those productive beneficial outcomes of, of social relationships. I it sounds like what you're talking exactly. about. Yeah, exactly. And I, there is also that aspect that we'll, people have talked about dark social capital, right? So the negative uh, implications that could come from that. So you may get a negative reputation based on the, re, the, the network of relationships that you have. So it, it, or, or bad, you know, bad information or other things like that. Yeah. And there's also a question in the chat from Aminal uh, from Bangladesh asking if you could elaborate a little bit about family business in China. I'm not sure if, if Aminal wants to come on and maybe ask that question a bit more specifically. Aminal might be might be on mute. Um, Tag, do you want to talk a little bit to that? I, I, I can uh, I can try. I'm certainly no expert on family businesses in China, but um, from my perspective, the 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 basic relationships tend to be the same. I think what would be, be uniquely different about uh, family businesses in China uh, is, is just the, the historical uh, nature of how ingrained families are with one another. Um, in the US, we might be much more likely to uh, separate from a family. Uh, we may have the independence or freedom to be able to do that, whereas the uh, the the I guess um, the expectations in China might be that you stay within the family and that the 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 hierarchy is is more established and and uniform and uh, family members may have less option to do their own thing or to break out or uh, to stay maintained. But um, the basic ideas I think are still pretty prevalent between the close-knit nature of the social relationships in family businesses or in families, and then those permeate to the family business. Although it, there may be, it may be less equal among the family members. So you may have more um, uh, patriarchal kind of a situation where 
where one family member uh, kind of dominates the the family. I think what you're talking about is, you know, that um, social capital theories are often widely applicable across different cultural contexts. It's just that the context in which it operates can be very different, but the general theory seems to be widely applicable. Y yes, very well stated. That's exactly right. All right, shall we move on with the presentation? Everyone, feel free to continue to add any questions you have in the chat and we can pause as we go along. All right. So the next uh, kind of uh, slide shows um, one other aspect that I've been thinking more, uh, more fully about. Um, I haven't really developed my ideas well yet, but there, the, the issue that one of the things that is growing in uh, interest in, um, in the family business realm, which is applicable, is the notion that we're not just talking about single family businesses, but we're talking about more business families. So families that have multiple businesses that they kind of oversee in different areas, which adds another level of complexity. So you notice that my, uh, my chair is uh, held by uh, the Siraj uh, family, which is the owners of a community coffee. So they're a Starbucks-like, uh, more regional uh, coffee company. And I'm, they're not small by any means, um, but they are much more regional, uh, not global. But they are arranged much more like the second um, representation than the first. So in the first, you have a a family that is kind of the nucleus of the business and all the family is involved with the key business. And then you have external uh, core members that are but not, not family members. And then you got core non-family outsiders. Now you could have an outside family member that's not part of the family or the business, but most of the time you see this kind of traditional view and that's kind of the perspective we most often take. More so we see in, uh, in kind of more modern times, we see this family being not the nucleus, but more like the overseeing uh, social unit that manages the businesses. And you may have um, family members that are in one or two or three or five businesses. And as the family gets older, more, uh, more generations tied on, this, this number of businesses tends to grow. So that community coffee company that I'm uh, referring to, they're uh, starting their fifth generation. Um, so they have networks of cousins, you know, that, that, that go all over the place. And some of them are involved with the business, some of them are not, but all of them maintain some, some ownership and that comes within the family. So they may not be even, uh, doing anything with the businesses, but they may be part of the family doing things like philanthropy, um, uh, nonprofit kind of uh, situations. Um, so the family has its own organization that is tied, but relatively more loosely to each of the businesses. So to me, that's an it's interesting concept to start thinking about the family as an organizational unit that has businesses that are tied to it, but yet it's not this traditional view that, uh, that we've kind of come to understand and think about in terms of family business. So there's, there's a, a whole mess of questions and, and opportunities for study um, or for consulting um, that deals with this more complex web of relationships and how the social capital is utilized and managed in this kind of situation. I'm reading the chat here. Um, I'm keeping an eye on it. But... Okay. Um, so the you know these these kind of issues are, are important to me, or I think they're important uh, everywhere because you know the family relationships are idiosyncratic, but most families. And this will vary, uh, but they share really strong norms, values, visions, purposes, goals, and that makes makes them uh, a very strong social unit that can potentially 
um, have a really uh, big impact on the development of social capital, not just for the, the family, but also for organizations, their businesses, and maybe even other firms. So the idea that the family can be a, a major uh, component in the development of social capital that then leads itself to entrepreneurial competitive advantages for the firm. And arguably, they, the, these, what we often talk about is what the difference between family and non-family firms actually is. It may actually be this ability uh, or presence of, of creating uh, strong familial-based uh, networks that then lead to very strong, um, important social capital uh, aspects. So, um, the the I just kind of feel like that there's there's a, this area of research and and uh, that is really being uh, hadn't been fully uh, investigated yet especially as things are changing in, in the uh, in the kind of dynamic environment that we're in. So I had a couple of questions, um, not necessarily for, uh, for us to answer per se, but just kind of food for thought um, and some things I'll, I'll throw out some basic uh, early ideas that I've had about this and then, then we can discuss. Um, First question is how can family leaders best utilize social networks? That being at the multi-level individual group or family level and the organizational level to gain access to resources that are needed in the pursuit of opportunity. So I'm, I'm really focusing in on the kind of idea of opportunity and entrepreneurship. Um, one, because I really believe that's, that's the name of the game moving forward. The world is so, is changing so fast. There's lots of things going on. Um, you kind of got to move with it, uh, change and adapt, look for new opportunity or you're going to get left behind. So it's a really important aspect of things. And then the second question is how can social capital be transformed into entrepreneurial activities and outcomes? So that kind of black box uh, uh, thing that, uh, that I even noticed in my own kind of thinking is we talk about social capital, we talk about outcomes, but we don't talk about the intervening mechanisms or processes that take and use those resources and capabilities and turn them into actual actions or tactics. Um, and so what mechanisms can facilitate opportunity of detection, willingness to pursue opportunity and confidence, et cetera, to move forward. So both of these questions are kind of academic, but also practitioner in, in their basis. Um, so in that book chapter, I, I, we put together, and, and I won't go through these in detail, but we kind of put together some basic tactics like actions that would be kind of taking, trying to kind of stimulate a phenomenologically based idea between connecting social capital to, to certain kinds of entrepreneurial outcomes. Uh, so internal kind of perspective or more of a bonding perspective is like things like encouraging employees and family members to bring up new ideas or create, be creative. Um, how do you incentivize or is incentivizing opportunity um, in a traditional work setting? Um, structured teams involving family and non-family. How do you change these teams regularly? Do you do new tasks? Um, social activities, how do you engage people in more social activities so we build and that, that those bonding mechanisms to create uh, new things. Externally, looking for uh, how do you uh, bring in outside people. One of the challenges for family businesses is often they, they get insulated and they, they, they only promote from within. They, they, the family members only are the ones that make the big decisions. Um, but that really works against them in, in a lot of ways. And so how do you bring in outsiders into and engage them so that you can uh, stimulate new ideas, develop new knowledge, et cetera. So temporary workers, consultants, key positions within the company, outsiders are important for that. Um, engaging in, in external ent entities, um, trade shows, conferences, um, 
a looking for you uh, outside ties uh, outside of just the business things like churches social units clubs um, and then increasing interaction engagement with the company of stakeholders suppliers etc so the idea basically is there are some specific actions or activities that we know uh, would would create social capital um, and then how, also there are tactics that or changes that you can make to the organization that utilize social capital to ultimately lead to actions that can result in uh, positive outcomes. So looking more into those things, being specific about that study. So kind of, kind of to leave us kind of towards the end and then we can open this up to, to just discussions, question and answers, thoughts. Um, I was just thinking about our trends for the future. There's been a lot of talk about fa family de demographics that are changing. People are living longer. People are having less children. Um, there's, uh, there's an aging workforce that we're seeing that's problematic in a lot of uh, countries, China being one of those. Um, there's, there's a changing kind of definition of quote unquote, what is a family? Uh, we don't, there's a lot of people that aren't in a, a traditional kind of family situation. So what does that mean to the creation of social capital, how we utilize social capital uh, in the business setting? Um, environmental and sustainability issues, societies, governments, industries, uh, even families are more concerned about the environment and sustainability than they have ever been before. Um, what does that mean? All right, so how does that work? Uh, with uh, social capital and, and the outcomes that we see. Um, one of the keys for family business is a thing, uh, a key issue that we're dealing with is called social emotional wealth. Some of you may have heard that term, but that's basically the idea that uh, non-economic factors may be and often are more important to family business than the economic factors. And this is where that kind of comes in, we're seeing, seeing, seeing a lot of families that have a lot of wealth becoming much more interested in, in non-economic factors than economic factors. And how do you use that uh, for the organization and, the, and to better the family? Uh, future work, digitization, you know, AI, automation, robotics, work from home. All of these are changing the dynamics, not just uh, not just in business, but also in the family and uh, doing, considering those kind of things together, family and business, what does that mean? How does that change our structures of what we do, our work environment um, and the outcomes that we see? And then finally, societal trends, uh, global prosperity, living standards, longevity have all increased. It's kind of related to the first, uh, but there's also a, a, there's a, a lot of disparity between uh, the rich and the poor. Um, there's some uh, changes in how people view uh, economics, um, what we should be doing from a political perspective. So there's a lot of issues that kind of go into to those, those questions that I, I believe a lot of these can be uh, addressed, answered, or at least studied using a social capital perspective. And a lot of these have to do with families. And uh, there's, a, there's an intersection there that really uh, makes a lot of sense to me, something that we could look at uh, as both academics, practitioners, uh, both, it's an important area. So I guess closing kind of comment, innovative, innovatively adapting to a fast changing environment is the key to business in modern days. It's just things are changing. We need to adapt, change, be innovative. And I think social capital is a key component to survival. And I will add on to that, particularly for family businesses, because often they tend to be, uh, I don't want to say stuck in the past, but they do, they do tend to be, have a little bit longer term perspective. They tend to uh, put a lot of weight on tradition. And sometimes that can, can lead to being less uh, willing to adapt and change moving forward. All right, so that's kind of what I had. Um, I'm completely open to discussion or talk or um, questions, whatever. Thanks, Doug. I'm sure there's going to be quite a lot of questions. Um, I've got one question. 
that that black box that exists between social capital and the outcomes of social capital, it, it seems to me that, that social capital theories don't have a lot of answers there. There's not a lot of ability to explain the processes that are going on that might cause it. But I think within uh, various social theories, there, there are some potentially really useful um, concepts that could be brought into social capital theory that, that might help. And one that comes to mind for me is something like social identity theory um, that can help to explain, you know, in-group and out-group effects and all of these kinds of things. Do you, are you aware of or have you thought about what kinds of um, sociological theories might be useful? It's funny you should say that because social identity was something that I just kind of recently had a little bit of an aha moment with, and I was thinking exactly that same thing. Other than that, I haven't really, I haven't come across anything that I really that oh, that really makes a lot of sense. Um, but at the same time, I recognize that it's an issue. And I think that's kind of, I, I was talking to one of my doctoral students uh, the other day, and we were talking about how come there hasn't been more, I guess, more progress in terms of social capital. Um, there's been a lot of studies and a lot of interest, but I, from a theoretical perspective, I haven't seen, and I could be missing things, but I haven't seen a lot of really uh, big movements in what we say or do or think about social capital. And I think that's part of the issue. We haven't brought in some alternative perspectives that kind of fill in some of those holes. Um, I think that's kind of the challenge, but I don't really have a lot of answers at this time. Well, it, and it does seem like one of those challenges because social capital is so interdisciplinary that um, you know, there, there might be some really valuable lessons like social identity theory potentially coming out of social psychology or psychology that might be really useful. But I think it's, it's difficult for a lot of researchers on social capital to, to bring in those theories and to meaningfully give them treatment unless they have some familiarity with something like social psychology. And, and there might be other theories as well coming from other disciplines that might be quite relevant. And I guess this is where um, yourself in management being very multidisciplinary, it could be a really good opportunity to try and bring in some of those, those theories and, and, and maybe if they can help to sort of unpack that black box a little bit. Yes, I, I totally agree. And that's, that's, I guess that's where I'm, as I've thought about this over the last month or so, it's just, I, I've come to the conclusion that, you know, I, I only have limited time. So um, we all, you throw it out there and hopefully some young <laughs> some young scholar with a lot of energy can come through and and, and make a big contribution because I, I just like I've got a lot of questions but I don't haven't been able to have the time or uh, uh, I don't know the ability to to uh, spend time answering those questions yeah I think like one way to think about this is that social capital relates in many ways to to the question of human cooperation. you know why are humans cooperative? And this is one of the key challenges of the social sciences. you know it's kind of been identified as one of those those main challenges that that's relevant across so many different disciplines. And I think thinking about it in that way, then that it it really does, um, help us to understand how complex it is and how we don't have a lot of answers to these kinds of things and how we probably do need to take very multidisciplinary approaches to try to understand what's happening in that black box. So perhaps not give us such a hard time, ourselves such a hard time about <laughs> there being a black box, I suppose. Right, um, right. But also so if then... We knew what, if we knew what all the black boxes had in them, then we wouldn't have a job, I don't think. So... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, true. Absolutely. And I think like another big part of that black box must be, you know, norms and, and normative influence. And again, that's an area that quite a lot of research has been done and work has been done within, particularly within sociology. So it's another area that potentially could be brought in and help us to un uncover and understand some of those processes a little more. Shall we, um, what questions do we have, Marion, in the chat? You, I think you had one. Well, yeah, I've got a thousand. But I'm not going to ask a thousand. <laughs> well, let's start, start with one from you. <laughs> uh, well, I, I did post one about the generational, third and fifth generational um, issue, but I just thought I'd put that question into context um, in terms of strategy. Uh, my big question, I, I work in uh, Western Sydney uh, where there is many, many family businesses uh, in the School of Business, we actually have many of the second generation um, 
of new migrant businesses coming through. Uh, and so we see these dilemmas that are going on um, for this generation in terms of going forward. Um, I worked with a, a student that was just about to go and work for a significant organisation that his father owned. And I looked at, we look, we scrounged around and looked at another at strategies around, anyway, it, it's a big research area. Um, but we struck on sort of open strategy of sort of trying to adopt uh, a much more open strategic view of the organisation. Do you think there's some leverage in, in that kind of view? I'm just trying to be advising some of these, uh, in a practical sense, some of these new generations that are coming through and inheriting these large organisations of how to drive change strategically through the business. And open strategy kind of does it a little bit. Do you think? <laughs> okay, so I guess I'm trying to get exactly what the question is. Do I think that uh, a strategic perspective applied to these family businesses is an appropriate one mm. is, that, is that basically it yeah i guess that is and and okay. bringing in uh lots of networks and lots of information through opening up the strategy a bit more yes i think i, I I'm, I'm a first and foremost i'm a strategic management kind of scholar so that's that's kind of where my background came from mm. and i'm a firm believer in the strategic management process so Anytime I, if I personally go and consult uh, admit, uh, any kind of organization, but particularly family businesses, I think it's really important to kind of uh, break down the kind of uh, strategic management process for them, because a lot of these, the, the second and, and third generation, they'll have grown up in, uh, in the business and they haven't had a much experience outside of that. So they end up getting a blinders on in a lot of times because they, they've seen it done one way and they're not really open to how things have been done in other areas or taking different viewpoints. So kind of allowing them to see some of that kind of more open um, and, and breaking kind of the mold of this is how we've done it always um, is really enlightening for them. And it also it tends to engage them more if they think that they can have a creative process and be involved in the organization beyond kind of what dad or granddad or grandmom did. And um, I think that's, that's a very important aspect of it. So I, I guess the answer is yes. I, I think that's, there's a lot of opportunity for that. Um, but a lot of it involves getting them in the room together and, and working through a process themselves so that, uh, uh, they can kind of get a feel for what what is being done that may be different than than what they thought was being done, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, there's yeah in the strategy practice field. Sorry, I teach strategy as well. So um, and leadership. So the um, uh, the the issue becomes that third and fifth generation as well. When you actually sort of look at it, and, and when you're sort of looking at businesses that fail, they tend to be on the third or fifth generation. So there's lots of research within the strategic area that I think that can actually get linked in here. So do you think so too? Yes. And, and I, I, what the, one of the biggest problems going from like second to third and then even third, fourth, fifth, and just add on, um, they, they, they are forced typically to be, become more professional. So it's, it, they have to have more professional systems in place. They have to have kind of more merit-based um, uh, processes and structures and things like that. So that professionalism, that professional, professionalization of the organization is very important, especially second to third generation where you're getting more and more people involved, but they, have, uh, they don't have the processes, the structures in place uh, that a, a non-family business would already have in place. Um, so I, I think that's extremely important. Okay, uh, thank you. We'll keep on talking about that. But somebody, uh, sorry, I'll just spin. I think um, Gada Solomon might have a yep. Uh, have a question. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself now if you would like to, to pose your question. 
Um, they were unmuted while you were talking, but there was a little bit of background noise, so I muted them. Feel free, Gara Soliman, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. No? No, may not be here. Um, we could move on to Aminal. Aminal, do you want to ask your, your question? Yes, I asked my question uh, too. Uh, how do you think about future thoughts on family business that may include uh, social business theory, existing social business theory? Am I clear? Yeah, okay. So uh, family business that may include social business theory. Um, I guess I'm not sure exactly what you mean by social business theory, or is that just... Uh, um, it was introduced by Professor Dr. Yunus, social business theory. I, I guess I'm not familiar with what social business theory is. Are you are talking about like the, the, um, the role that like... Uh, it was introduced by Professor Dr. Uh, Muhammad Yunus, Nobel laureate. Are we talking about social enterprises? Yes. Ah. Oh, so like social ventures? Okay. Yep. Okay. Yes. Um, the one of the things I've seen, and this is uh, as much through um, the the uh, academic world as it is through just my interaction with family businesses is their their increasing interest from families in in any kind of kind of social um, agenda right or social outcome um, which is create which is forcing them or not forcing but incentivizing some of them to try to combine their business interests with their social interests and they're starting of not just for-profit uh, business ventures, but also nonprofit business ventures, and then engaging in a lot of philanthropy. So I think the future of family business is going to go a lot in that direction, especially as we get, we get more and more of these uh, extended multi-generational families that have multiple businesses. They're looking for outlets, not only for their children or children's children to be engaged, uh, but they're looking to do good. So they, they are sitting on a good bit of wealth, many of them, and they're, they're trying to find ways to be engaged. But social venturing is a big part of, of all business right now. Uh, just be, that tr changing trend where people are more and more concerned about society, the environment, uh, those types of issues, they're looking for ways to combine both the social aspect and the economic aspect um, together in a, in a single business entity. And in some ways it may even be expected for many new businesses now, um, but that usually is, is derived partly from their, the influence of their family, what their, inf what their family is interested in, what they consider their core values or beliefs um, naturally get uh, ingrained in the nature of the business itself. And so I think that's a very important future area for family business research, but also um, just uh, in general management or entrepreneurship research as well. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, sounds like it. Thank you. Uh, so I think we had a, maybe it was a, a comment um, from Jay Riverside. Uh, in the chat um, says makes me think about clan theory within organizational theory so it's not really a question but did you have any comment on that one Ty? well like i i i've always thought clan theory explains a lot of things <laughs> my uh i used to talk about that a lot my wife is a uh, is a nurse and i've always in it's always been interesting to me how in certain organizations and nursing and particularly in hospitals is particularly this way um, where there's a lot of clan control where you have um, the expectations are controlled simply by uh, over basically on, on fears of what other people might say or do or say about you or do to you 
and clan control is a very prevalent thing even on the on, uh, online mediums now right so uh, i think there's a lot of that but clan control works also in the family um there's there's uh there's a there's a big component of that too it would be interesting if somebody brought some of those old uh thoughts back and seen it if they applied uh to more kind of modern contexts uh might be very interesting uh, Jay Riverside, did you want to unmute yourself? You had some additional follow-up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, basically, it's, a, it's related to the emotional and rational aspects of the family business, I think. Somehow, this is the, 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 the values that, that are in, the inputs that are brought to the, to the, to the family business, I think. No, I agree with you. I think there, there's a big component of the family business that has to do with the emotional or non-financial kind of aspects. And that's one of the big, uh, over the last 10 years in the family business literature, that's been a big push is this understanding that family business are different uh, in many ways because they have more concern about those non-economic aspects. That isn't to say that all organizations don't have some non-financial kind of interest, but family businesses concern tend to be concerned more about reputation, you know, quality, um, qu quality of life. Those types of things tend to uh, supersede economic uh, concerns, I guess, as long as the economics don't go too far down, right? So if, as long as things are going well, they'll really care about those aspects of things. But there's also been studies that show that, well, if things do get, you know, sideways in terms of financially, uh, uh, you know, economics, then the business will revert back to being a much more traditional kind of viewpoint where economics is the is the driving force. Jay okay, Riverside, anything to add on that? Should we move on to the next question? Uh, there was a, a question or probably more a comment really in the chat. Uh, in Russia, there is a tendency for businesses, business founders to exclude their sons and daughters from business and make sure the business is run by partners. Makes me think about the value of family for business in the future. So not really a question, but a, perhaps a comment. Anastasia's uh, here to ask or make comment and, and ask question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful lecture and for the great atmosphere and for uh, the opportunity to ask a question. I just wanted to um, kind of um, tell you a little bit about Russian situation. I think it's pretty unique because uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, we had uh, a huge amount of companies founded in the 90s and they were all founded by young people who are now getting older and um, there is a massive uh, problem with uh, inheritance inheritance with uh, passing the business over to the next generations like it's uh, it's uh, important for so many businesses and um, the mechanisms uh, do not exist no one knows how to do it there is even little legislation about it and uh, so many companies found themselves find themselves in um, in a mess pretty much for example if a founder the owner of the company dies and uh, his sons and daughters come to the business and they've never been in the business they don't know anything about it and uh, the company just um, faces difficulties so um, and I talk to businessmen about it and they say that they do not, they do not want their, um, sons and daughters in the business. They rather prefer to, um, have their partners and other professionals who they communicate with, who they trust to take over the business, uh, but not, not the family. And it's, it's interesting to think, uh, what to do, what to, uh, what to advise, uh, to these businessmen, because the value of the family is um, important and maybe we lost as a society, maybe we lost the value of the family. We don't understand how good it is to, to have a family running the business, for example, or, um, or it is, it is a, actually a different trend that the family and the new way of our societies, organizations they, that allow us to 
partner with other people, not with our family, to trust other people, right? To form other types of social connections and maybe build other types of social capital, not family social capital, but focus on other type, yes, organizational or um, business social capital. So I was just thinking about it. And um, yeah, from the literature I read uh, from the West, the value of the family is um, unquestionable. Like the family is uh, is there and uh, it's, uh, the, as you said, a, nu a nuclear, the oldest nuclear unit, but maybe something is changing. At least in our part of the world, it's, uh, it's a question, yeah. I think that's very fascinating. I'm, I'm I, I mean, this is clearly an empirical question, but I, I kind of wonder what the motivations are. So if they say, I don't want my children to be involved, is it because they don't trust their children to do a good job? And in that case, you say, well, you could train them, right? You, you bring them in early, you train them, you go through a succession plan. You There's there's tons of literature out there about how to, to do succession planning and all the, the pitfalls that come with that. But is it, or is the question that maybe they don't want their children to do the same thing they do? Maybe they see too many negatives. Maybe they want something better for them. They want them to leave and go somewhere else to have a better life in another area. I don't know that. I think it's, it's fascinating that, that you say this because I, I, I don't know that there, there's something innate about uh, blood relationships. And uh, I, we, we probably, or at least, I know with my children, I care very much about their welfare, um, but what I think they should do uh, may be different than what is best for me. Maybe I think that what I'm, I'm doing them a favor by not involving them. I don't know that. I think it's a very interesting issue, but something that you could definitely dig into and maybe get some insight into kind of alternative uh, motivations for why they would or would not involve their children in their business situation. Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I don't have a real answer, but the succession plan or the succession is an ongoing and probably always will be a big problem for most family businesses globally, not just because you have a limited number of children, but they may not even be qualified to take over. For instance, I was one of uh, four children, but I was the only one that went to pharmacy school. So I was the only viable candidate to take over my father's pharmacy, right? So that, just by skill level. So that, so when we had to have a very serious talk about was I going to take over that business or not? And I didn't want to, and therefore it changed his whole demeanor about does he want to continue forward with the business? And he sold it to a partner. So uh, those those types of issues are, are prevalent, I think, across the board, but it, it, it got to have serious talks and you got to have to have a, a real um, structured succession plan. And it has to start early in, in the children's lives. Tristan, I've asked um, Hannah if you'd like actually to make a comment on that. So we have a large... Um, a uh, set of colleagues sitting here. And so I, I was thinking maybe Mohanad might like to make some observations that help might help Anastasia or anybody. Yeah, yeah. Hello? Hello. Yes, you're on. I yeah, can hear you. I'm Mohanad. Yeah, I just wanted to ask him about his uh, definition of social capital. So he considers the, the resources acquired from social relationship as social capital. Am I right? Yes. Uh -huh. And yeah, and when we speak about bridging and the linking and, and the, how, how do you see this concept of this definition of uh, social capital, bridging, linking and bounding? How do you use them in your research or how do you see them? I, I, I look at those as mechanisms through which we gain social capital. So, so you do bonding to, to establish networks, relationships, whatever, uh, ties, and those then lead to the acquisition or potential acquisition of resources or capabilities. 
So bounding, bounding for you, what, what do you mean by bound, bounding social capital? Bonding? Uh, so yeah. bonding, bonding is a mechanism for social capital. So it's a, it's a way of gaining uh, the things that we consider social capital. So bonding is a, is a, is a form uh, that creates norms, values, et cetera. Those are the values and the norms are the actual social capital bonding and there are bonding mechanisms that lead to those types of, of social capital. So when you measure social capital, what exactly you measure? Okay, resources that's, or the, what? What? Well, that's 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 a that's a that's a debatable issue right there. Most yeah. people in, in the field, when they measure quote unquote social capital, they actually just measure networks. Right. They just yeah. measure the ties. So, so the number of ties. But that's not really the measure of social capital. That's a measure. That's a proxy. So it's a proxy for the amount. Say you have a a close knit group. You're going to assume that because it's close knit group, we have uh, really strong norms. If you really wanted to measure norms, you would have to measure norms. Right? Yeah. Um, so okay. the, the, there's there's a big there's a there's a big problem with that in the extant literature just because. He's, there's there's this big assumption that if we measure the network, that's a good proxy, and it may be in many cases a proxy for the actual uh, level of capital that we have. But there's no there's if without measuring it, we don't know. It's just a proxy. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm a PhD kind uh, researcher, and I I I use uh, the concept of social capital. Uh, to understand why some people innovate while other not. So I'm from Syria and I one of my cases is uh, uh, a community, an ethnic minority in Syria, they are Turkmen. So I, I try to, to, to measure. So last month I was in, uh, in Syria and I measure uh, how can I say everything I, I want using qualitative and quantitative uh, methods. So I, I will I, I try to understand how how uh, uh, farmers, I study uh, farmers community, how farmers uh, use their uh, social networks, bounding, linking, bridging to uh, to and what, kind of resources they acquire from these uh, social relations and how they uh, use it, do, do they use it in, in innovation and how this affect their performance. So I, I, I try to understand the, the whole mechanism of, uh, of this, uh, of the effect of social capital. Yeah, it's it's correct. When we have a bounding community, it's a minor minority and ethnic. They have a high level of bounding social capital, and I try to understand the dark and the bright uh, side of social capital. In literature, we see that uh, we read that uh, in such a uh, community. Uh, we should have dark social capital. So they, they, they uh, theoretically, uh, maybe they will not uh, innovate. And I, I, I try to understand why they started to be innovative. So they try to, uh, to introduce uh, uh, new techniques. Uh, they are, they tried uh, to enter new markets. Why? So after my research, I try, I understand that. Uh, uh, no, uh, from right now. So uh, there, there's um, ten years ago, an NGO in Syria tried to support them. So in this in this situation, uh, uh, so uh, the behavior of farmers started to to change from um, uh, non innovator to innovator. But not all of them uh, uh, started to innovate. So we have, after this integration of uh, non-governmental organizations, some of them started to innovate, while others not. 
So they use their uh, bridging social capital, bridging uh, relation, uh, and they started to get financial and, uh, as you said, informational and um, even uh, emotional support from, from them. So I try to understand the whole process, the mechanism of uh, how we get benefit from social capital. So I, I uh, okay. For, for me, I, I understand the, the dark side of uh, social capital as well. Uh, when the in family, they are family business. So, so their, their fathers, uh, they refuse to adopt innovation. So to introduce uh, new techniques in, in, in farming. So it's a dark side of uh, social capital. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's the, the it's a common challenge to see, say we have to measure our network or our relationships. And then what is the the actual piece of capital that we get out of this. So we have maybe have a network a relationship to this NGO or to banks or whatever that gives us financial capital. That's the capital we receive from the relationship. That financial capital then can be utilized to be more innovative. We can do R&D or whatever. And then that R&D will then be lead to innovativeness and hopefully future performance. So it's a you can't just say the network leads to high performance. There are at least two steps that go in between that in the process. Yeah. And we have to measure each of those steps individually. And that's where we get into real trouble as researchers because we tend to skip over things just because it's either hard to gather or we can't measure it easily. Yeah, after reading your uh, research and articles, I tried to, to fill this gap and to measure, uh, to, to understand the mechanism and why, why it's, uh, you always uh, say that we contingency theory and we have to, to, to study the uh, moderate variables between uh, no, networks and the uh, performance. So I tried to, to fill this gap and uh, hopefully uh, to, to get uh, good uh, research. Yeah, and well, this is luck. one case. <laughs> yeah, and this is one case. The other case, uh, uh, a small we ha I have two or three case studies and the other they, they 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 don't have any kind of innovation so I and so I will do uh, no it's, it's a little bit complicated but uh, yeah. maybe I can write through later on about this or not <laughs> certainly no problem okay okay thank you sir I think um, Tyg's making a really good point here about the way in which we measure social capital, because um, we quite often will measure things that are effectively sources of social capital, which really stand in for a proxy that social capital exists. You know, if we have a the built environment, a, a walkable neighbourhood in a certain situation, if we have, um, you know, a, a membership in voluntary association that's likely to create the sorts of things that we would call social capital. So it, it's a proxy, it stands in for it. Um, but often we are also measuring outcomes of social capital. You know, uh, membership in voluntary association might be considered to be an outcome. So we could measure that and that gives an indication that social capital exists. So I think quite often when we're measuring social capital, it might be some of the source or the form or the consequence. The key thing is to be clear about what it is that we are measuring, because if we are measuring source or consequence, not, not what social capital actually is, then as Ty was saying, you know, there can be other factors that are coming into play that we're not measuring. Um, and so we're really just making assumptions that a certain network configuration, for example, is resulting in certain types of social capital. Uh, and that, I think that's the danger and what we need to do to improve the quality of our research, we need to examine those assumptions that we're making. So uh, any other questions coming up, Marion? Uh, no, I've actually, um, okay. Uh, I was actually asking some of our contributors um, whether or not they actually sort of had a question. Um, and no, so there's no questions. So I guess that's open slather for you and I, Tristan. Okay, well, did you have any other questions, Marion? Uh, not at this stage, no, no, no. I've been oh. very busy on chat. How are we going for time, Ty? Because I do have at least one more question. Have you got time for a couple more? Oh, certainly. Yes, I'm fine. Great. 
So I was, I was wondering, you know, a really topical question at the moment is with the pandemic and people working a lot more from home, and it's one of the things that you mentioned in, in, the, in the presentation, um, how you think family businesses maybe give an advantage or a disadvantage for, with people working from home? And I guess the second part of the question is, with your understanding of social capital, what can businesses do to, to mitigate some of the um, disadvantages of working from home from a social capital perspective? Okay. Uh, on the on the first question, I think that what I have seen um, is that family businesses do have a distinct advantage uh, in the pandemic, uh, where where the pandemic had a, a big influence on shutdowns um, and uh, and the workforce problems that we at least we've seen around here, uh, just finding people that are willing to work um, because your family. One, you get, you know, when, when, you, when you get shut down or you have to be quarantined, you quarantine with your entire family. So you're already quarantined with your family. You can still work together. Um, so you can go to the office, you can work. So if, if, if the bulk of your workforce is family, you kind of get around that. So there, there's some, some distinct advantages with that because um, you're going to see each other anyway. So if you're working together, that kind of uh, overcomes that problem. Uh, Relatedly, um, if a, a portion of your workforce is from the family, um, they uh, they're going to work, right? Even if if you can't pay them, or even you know, you, you can even bring in extra family members to help. They're going to be um, more likely to to work and help you overcome uh, business problems, um, just because they have a. Uh, uh, a relational uh, a relationship with you and to the business um, and so there's going to be some distinct advantages so that's probably part of the reason why family businesses tend to just be uh, they tend to persevere is because they have a way of overcoming some of these things just through the nature of the family and it's in its uh, and its interaction and its relationship that it has and there's a devotion to that family that that uh, supersedes any kind of difficulty that you might have as an individual. Um, so I, I, I think I, in answer to your question, I think there's some distinct uh, advantages to having a family business and some of the things that were going on. And I think what you'll find is there'll be a lot of family business, uh, family businesses that were started up as well uh, during this time. Absolutely. So what do you think about the second part of the question about, you know, for businesses who are working from home, because even for family businesses, some employees are likely to be working from home and isolated from the rest of the business. You know, with your understanding of social capital, what do you think people could do to mitigate that a bit? I, you know, I've, I've, this is a hard, that's a hard question, but, you know, we are, uh, people are social. I mean, that that's kind of an understanding uh, that I've come even though we some people like to work at home and it is convenient in many ways people still need for for the most part uh still need a social outlet so creating uh social opportunities even if it's online uh goes a long way uh of overcoming kind of isolation and 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 problems we we just we're, we're meant to be social uh we get into kind of mental health issues if we're not social so as an employer, um, it would it would be best if you made sure that people were staying engaged in some way, either through um, either through online mechanisms um, or having social functions that uh, are outside. In academia, we we uh, tend to be pretty isolated, um, and so we'll make it a point uh, to get together with our, our research group on a regular basis just to have dinner or something. You know, so it's important that we engage with each other on a semi-regular basis. Uh, and I think as an employer, that's an important thing that you need to implement so that people have, have opportunities to interact in a social setting just to maintain some of those relationships and ties. Otherwise, uh, there won't be innovation. There won't be new ideas. Uh, work will slip. I think we'll see a lot of negative implications from that if you don't do those things. 
it seems like a lot of businesses are, are quite aware of this. And, and you know, in the past, um, a lot of businesses seem to be so focused on productivity and efficiency, they reduced social interaction time, you know, almost removed the tea room so that people couldn't go and, 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 and talk and, and spend time socialising. Right. And it, it almost seems like the, the pandemic and working from home is also almost forcing some of these businesses to actually reprioritise social time. Have you seen any evidence of that happening in what you're looking at? I, I think you're, you're you're hitting it uh, very squarely on the head. It's it's it, they they are aware of these things, um, and they realize this is important. But at the same time, uh, they're not sure exactly how to best go about implementing that kind of issue. And so I've seen some some real challenges. But um, I think it ha it has the I guess some good things that have come out of this. The pandemic is where we're having to reevaluate what our priorities are, and a lot of people are finding out that having having relationships with people is important, and that uh, and we probably took it for granted somewhere along the way, and we need to figure out a way to do better. So, so it seems like technology is a little bit of a limitation. You know, we we have this fantastic technology we're using right now to be able to communicate almost face to face across vast distances. Um, what other limitations do you think there are to technology? Like if, if you could have any technology at all to improve social capital, you know, what do you think that would be? Ooh, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, well, it, you know, my, uh, I have two boys and they're ages nine and 11. And we talk about how nice it would be to be able to transport anywhere instantly. Um, so if I was in on a Star Trek or something, then we could transport, um, instantly that would be a great great tool um minus that you know i'm thinking like uh, uh, uh virtual reality kind of situations i think there'll continue to be some improvements in that um I, we've come a long way in the last couple of years just in the terms of this this capability in the zoom and people's ability to deal with it and and hop on and hop off and that's been a great great deal i don't know that's a tough question did you have any ideas uh well i mean i think we're we're kind of going there like you said like a virtual reality or perhaps augmented reality you know where we're moving beyond um this single camera kind of you know someone on a screen to something that's actually more immersive in our own environment you know where almost hologram kind of experiences if it was augmented reality or um you know actual virtual reality stuff and i know facebook is going that way a little bit with, with meta and I have some really big concerns about how that'll work, <laughs> um, <laughs> from a, a, you know, a, a social dynamics kind of point of view. But I, you know, I think that, that I think there's a lot of scope for technological developments to improve this, um, and and even the way normatively that we we define our meetings. You know, we we start our meeting, we get to business, maybe we have a, a casual chat first, but because they're online, we're often missing out on the, the walking into the room or, or going up in the, in the lift together or, or over the water cooler kinds of interactions that often don't occur because we, we get onto a Zoom call, we get to business, we finish it. You know? And so I think just normatively, we can do things a little bit differently, you know, get on a little bit earlier, stay a little bit later, um, you know, emphasize the social aspects of, of meeting times. Uh, so I think there's there's ways even with current technologies there's ways we can do things a little differently. Right. Aaron, was there a comment from Shirley in the in the chat? Was that a question? No, no, that wasn't a question. Um, and I've actually put a comment there about AI being used in the boardroom increasingly. So um, I guess the older generations tend to. Um, uh, not understand the power of technology. And so maybe that's a form of capital that the younger generations have within the organisation. So that's just a comment. But I did have a question for Ty about his advice going forward, because this group is an international group. Um, the video that we're doing now will be watched by many people. I'm pushing it out into suggesting also that teachers uh, or, you know, lecturers, et cetera, use the content. So my question is, what advice would you give to somebody that was interested in researching this area going forward, Ty? Uh, I guess my, my basic advice would be go for it. I think there's a, a ton of opportunity here. 
uh, that is very applicable. And um, I just think there's there's a there's just many avenues you could take. And so I I I'm, I, I often people often say, what should I study and what what's going to be the next fad? I think you can you can find a a solid theoretical uh, foundation in the social capital literature, and there's still plenty of avenues to take that you could make a major contribution, and you can do it from a qualitative or a quantitative perspective. Um, you can do it in multiple contexts. I, I just think there's just so many opportunities in this space um, and that haven't been tapped into yet. And I would, that's that would I would be encouraging as as what I would say, no specific direction per se, but uh, just that there, there's plenty of space and lots of opportunity. Um, I do have a final question. I'm sorry, I've asked you a lot of questions and some of them have been really quite difficult. <laughs> um, in a lot of the work that I do, I encourage people to uh, become more aware of the, the benefit, the importance of social capital. And as soon as they, they do understand the value, it tends to change their behavior quite a bit. You know, they start to uh, connect with more people, spend more time socializing, develop stronger relationships, perhaps not betray trust as readily, um, you know, be more loyal and, and, um, and of service to people. So is, do you think that's all of these things? Do you think that's part of the black box or does it fit specifically into the, the theoretical approach to social capital? I think I, I think that is part of the black box, but it also is, is pretty, I mean, the basic theory behind social capital is your relationships lead to good things, basically, right? Or, or I guess bad things too, but I mean, we're trying to get good things out of our relationships and these the, the relationships and the networks can be managed. And uh, I think once people finally, they, if they kind of come to that realization that it's a pretty simple concept, but it has lots of layers and complexity when you really start thinking about it, it becomes very interesting to them. And um, I, I've done the same thing. If I can just get people to understand the basic concept, then it makes them rethink about all different aspects of their life personal business, et cetera. And, and it does change behavior and it does, does really resonate with most people once they kind of get it down and really think about it. Absolutely. And I think when you, you were showing a couple of slides with things that we can do to improve social capital, I think that's what was coming to mind is like a lot of these things we already kind of know about intuitively. A lot of businesses already do a lot of these things, but understanding the value of social capital then increases the, the, the emphasis on them, the preparedness to do all of these things. And, and there's got to be a lot of benefits just from simply understanding the importance of it. Exactly. Yeah. So any final questions? I think we're getting pretty close to the 90 minutes. Um, so leave it open for any final questions. Feel free to um, take yourself off mute if you would like or pop something in the chat. All right, I've just, just said thank you from the social capital family. Somebody lab labeled us that group. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you all for your hospitality and the great questions and for your attentiveness. It's been a pleasure. I really do. Thank you for the kind words. Yeah, thank you very much, Tyg, on behalf of the entire group for taking the time to do this. We know how much effort uh, you put into pre uh, preparing for this kind of thing, and we really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Um, so I'll just end the recording now, but if everyone can just stay online, 